Okay, so we'll continue on with our discussion of the heart. Um, we just got done talking about the different membranes that surround the heart. Um, and remember, create that pericardium, the, the delicate um, visceral parietal pericardium, and then that tough fibrous pericardium or pericardial sac that surround and protect the heart. Okay, and we'll take a second to talk about the superficial anatomy. So that's like the surface anatomy. If you were looking at the heart from the outside, there are some key features and things that you can see or identify. Um, we know from lab that we have four chambers, right? And you can see these or differentiate between the chambers from the outside. You can see the two atria on the top and the two ventricles on the bottom. When we look at the outside of the two atria, the left atrium and right atrium appear much smaller than the ventricles do. Okay, and this is even more so on the real heart. You guys will see this week versus the models. The atria are tiny. Um, they look very, very small. One of the reasons for that is that they're very thin walled. What did we call the atria? What kind of chambers? Good job. Receiving chambers, right? They're receiving chambers. Their job is not to pump far distances. They're not very strong. So their walls are very thin. So they appear very small from the outside. Again, they can hold the same volume of blood as the ventricles though, because they expand. So as they fill up with blood, they have that little bumpy area that's called the auricle, and it kind of expands out wider and wider and wider as the um, atria fill up with blood. But on the top, we have the um, right atrium and the left atrium. Then on the bottom, we have the ventricles. So the right ventricle and the left ventricle. They appear much, much larger from the outside. And again, this is because they have really thick muscular walls. What did we call the ventricles? What kind of chambers? Pumping chambers. They contract hard to push the blood either to the lungs and back or to deliver it to the body and back. That takes force. They need to be strong. So they have a lot thicker, stronger walls. Um, so they appear a lot larger from the outside. We have a few sulci or a few grooves that kind of divide the heart up into different sections from the outside. Um, the coronary sulcus is a horizontal groove. So if we look at the heart like that, it goes horizontally like that, and it divides the atria from the ventricles. Okay, so a little groove that goes in and divides the top from the bottom. Then we have grooves that go in between the ventricles in the front and in the back. So in the front, it's the anterior interventricular sulcus. Anterior means what? Front. front, right? Like the belly side, the front. So anterior is the front. Interventricular means between the ventricles. And then the sulcus is just like a little groove. Um, we also have one in the back. So the posterior interventricular sulcus is a little groove in the back, again, between the left and right ventricles. So you can kind of divide the heart up from the outside by looking for these grooves. Um, now these grooves, when we, when we look at them from the outside, they're really important. We have large blood vessels that travel along them. So you'll see that like there's this little kind of divot that's right here, and then we'll have really big blood vessels that kind of come down um, that sulcus and we pad it with a bunch of adipose tissue. And that kind of cradles and protects those blood vessels um, to ensure, or to kind of protect them and ensure that the integrity of them doesn't get messed up at all. We'll see that on a picture in a sec. Um, this is the back of the heart, so let's start right here. Um, so right here we see the anterior portion of the heart or the front of the heart. And again, I said from the outside, you can differentiate the chambers. So you've got the atria on top and the ventricles on the bottom. And it's the patient's right and left, not yours. So the right atrium and left atrium, which is like more around the back, and then the right ventricle and left ventricle. Um, here you can see these grooves. So this would be the coronary sulcus. Again, this groove that goes between the atrium and the ventricles. And then in the front, we have the anterior interventricular between the ventricles. This is showing us the back. Again, we've got the atria on the top, the ventricles on the bottom. You can see the coronary sulcus going horizontally between the atria and ventricles. And then in the back, again, we have another one, the posterior interventricular sulcus. Um, again, I said that we have large vessels that travel along these sulci and these grooves, 
and we pad them with fat. Okay, this yellow tissue is just showing you the adipose tissue that kind of cushions and cradles those vessels as they travel around, travel around the heart. Okay, again, the ventricles are quite a bit bigger. Um, the atria have these little bumpy ridges that we call auricles, and those kind of disappear as the atrium fills up with blood and expands. So we've said that the heart is a muscular pump, right? It's made up of a thick wall of muscle. But this muscle is very different from the muscle tissue that we studied last year. Um, last year we talked about skeletal muscle tissue. Okay? This is cardiac muscle. Okay? And the muscle cells are very, very different from skeletal muscle cells in structure and in function. They contract. But that's about it. There's a lot of differences otherwise. Um, so let's do a quick comparison of cardiac muscle cells, um, really compared to skeletal muscle cells, or what you guys should be familiar with already. Cardiac muscle cells are much smaller. Remember when we looked at skeletal muscle, we said that one cell could be very, very long, inches long, right? Because of all of the myoblasts that fuse together. Um, cardiac muscle cells are microscopic. They're very, very small. Also, they are not multinucleate like we saw with skeletal muscle. Okay, they have one single nucleus that's typically in the center of a cell. The cells are branched. So when we look at cardiac muscle cells, we'll frequently see something that looks kind of like that with these branches on the end. Okay, and there's our single nucleus in the center. And what this does is this allows for us to have these like interconnections between cells. So this cell can communicate with this one and with this one. And we can have all of these interconnections between the cells so that they're all kind of talking to each other. They're all touching multiple other cells as they branch out. They also have something called intercalated discs. Um, now when we looked at them under the microscope, when we did the tissues chapter, these intercalated discs just looked like these really dark, vertical lines like this. So every once in a while you see this really, really dark vertical line. And we said, that's an intercalated disc. Um, intercalated discs aren't just these dark structures, they're actually incredibly important to how the cardiac muscle cell actually functions. Um, the intercalated discs are made up by of two kind of key features. We have gap junctions and desmosomes. Uh, we talked about hemidesmosomes before, which is like a half of a desmosome. Remember in the epithelial tissue, we said it was kind of like a little protein staple, right? That connected the tissues together. Well, a desmosome, the desmosome is like two staples that connect two cells together. Okay, so literally think of it like a protein staple. So we have this little desmosome that will connect those two cells together. So they're strongly linked to each other. Okay, these will have these little desmosomes connecting them to each other. Okay, just like proteins. I mean, sorry, just like staples. And they're also, the neighboring cells are also linked by gap junctions. A junction is just like where things come together, and a gap is like a hole in something, right? So right here, we'll have this little gap junction. Think of it like a little channel or a little tunnel that's connecting these cells to each other. So now the cytoplasm of this cell is connected to the cytoplasm of this cell. This is extremely important for the way that muscle cells work. Um, we're gonna talk through the action potential in a ton of detail as we go, hopefully at the end of today. But just in general, remember when we talked about stimulating cells, so stimulating a muscle cell, stimulating any cell. Remember, we depolarize the cell, right? We have to allow ions to enter positive ions to enter to depolarize it and generate an action potential. Because of these gap junctions, these connections between cells, if I generate an action potential in this cell, I can generate an action potential in every cell that follows. Because look, the positive ions enter, and are the positive ions gonna stay right here in a little clump? What are they gonna do? Spread, right? Diffusion. Think of like the action potential in a neuron, right? The positive charges are going to spread. So they'll spread through this gap junction over here to this guy. And enough of them spread over here and they'll depolarize 
to threshold, and then we'll have more charges enter, right? And they're not going to stay put. They're going to spread. So they'll spread to the next guy, and that'll start an extra potential in him. And again, just like dominoes falling, just like we saw going down the axon, because of these gap junctions, once I stimulate this muscle cell, I'll then stimulate these, and then these, and then these, and then these, and it'll spread throughout all of the muscle tissue. Super, super important for the way that the, um, that the muscle kind of works and the way that we want to transfer that, that stimulus from one cell and then have it ripple through the whole rest of the heart. Because we don't want part of the heart to contract, right? That doesn't really do us any good. We need the whole chamber to contract nicely in a nice orderly fashion. Um, and we can do that because of gap junctions. These desmosomes that link the cells together are important to kind of connect the force. Because remember, these cells are shortening when they contract. If they're not connected to each other, it doesn't do any good to have like a tiny shortening here and a tiny shortening, tiny shortening. It, it, you don't add it all together that way. You need them to all be stapled um, or connected at these desmosomes so that as they shrink, the whole tissue actually shrinks and contracts. Okay? Is that okay? okay we'll talk about the action potential a lot more as we go. Here we see the cardiac myocytes are the cardiac muscle cells. So you can kind of see like, red was not a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of not see. Um, you can kind of see like that is one cell. Right? Um, you can see that here, it's kind of interconnected to this cell. Um, then you, see, you can kind of see the way that they're situated a little bit. Um, a nice central nucleus, okay, they are not multinucleate, there's just one nucleus in each cell. They're very, very closely um, put together. We don't have a lot of extracellular space. These vertical lines, these are showing you the intercalated discs. Okay, that's where we have the desmosomes hooking these cells together and then the little tunnels or channels that interconnect the cytoplasm from this to this, so that we can spread those ions and spread that action potential from cell to cell to cell. So we kind of looked at the outside of the heart, right? We know what the superficial anatomy on the outside is. Um, we know a little bit about what the actual muscle cell looks like. Now we'll look at the internal anatomy of the heart. Okay, so this is like if we sectioned it or if we sliced it in half and actually looked inside. What do we actually see inside the heart? To be continued. Oh, that's only 13 minutes. Never mind. Just kidding. Um, okay, so if we section the heart, if we slice the heart, like this is my heart, okay, I cut it open, and I can see like open spaces inside it, right? Those are my, where are we going? Those are my chambers. So my right atrium, my left atrium, my right ventricle, and left ventricle. This thick wall of muscle that I see right here is called the myocardium. What does myo mean? Muscle, right? Like myocyte. Um, and cardi means heart. So the myocardium is the layer of heart muscle. So when you section this, this thick heart wall, right, that you see right here, this thick kind of dark red layer that you'll see is the actual myocardium, the layer of cardiac muscle. We also already mentioned the membranes that are on the outside of the heart. Right? Remember we said there's a membrane that lies right on the outer surface of the heart? And what do we call that? The epicardium. Right? It's also called the visceral pericardium. Right? So you could call it either visceral pericardium or epicardium. Epicardium is kind of easy though because that literally means upon the heart. It sits right on the outside <coughs> of the heart. Now we also have a membrane lining the inner surfaces. Because remember, we have all of these open rooms or open chambers inside the heart. So we line those surfaces too. So we've got another membrane that lines all of these inner surfaces of the heart. That one is called the endocardium. <coughs> okay, again, endo means within, 
pericardi, we said means what? Within the heart. So the epicardium, then the thick layer of myocardium, and then the endocardium, and then the blood. Um, we have a couple septa. Um, a septum is just a wall, like think of it like separators. Like your nasal septum, right, is the, the separator between the right and left side of your nasal cavity. Well, we have an interatrial septum and an interventricular septum. So the interatrial septum is just this wall that separates the right atrium from the left atrium. And I didn't draw it this way, but the one on the bottom is a lot bigger. Um, the interventricular septum is down here. It's just this muscular wall that separates the ventricles. Um, we also, as we mentioned in the lab, have two pairs of one-way valves present. So four valves total, two pairs of them. And again, they're one-way valves. So they control the flow of blood through the heart. We only want the blood to be flowing forwards. We never want it to go backwards. So we have valves that will allow, they'll open to let the blood flow through in the right direction. But if the blood tries to flow backwards, they shut so that the blood can never go backwards. It should always be going forwards through the heart so that the heart can pump efficiently. When we talk about these valves, we'll see that one pair of them are called the atrioventricular valves. Remember those are on either side of the heart between one of the atria and the, the corresponding ventricle. And then we have another pair of semilunar valves, which remember are at the base of the really big arteries that carry blood away from the heart. So before we get into too much detail about the valves, um, here we can see the internal anatomy of the heart. So again, I've sectioned this or I sliced it and I'm actually looking inside the heart now. Well, what chambers are up top? The atria. The atria. What chambers are on the bottom? The ventricles. The ventricles. Um, this wall in between the atria, it's kind of covered up by the vessel, but this wall between the atria is the interatrial septum. The wall between the ventricles is the interventricular septum. What's the thick wall of muscle called? Myocardium. The myocardium. Um, what's the layer on the outside called? Epicardium. Epicardium. Or what else? Visceral pericardium. And then the layer on the inside is the endocardium. endocardium. This is just kind of showing you a section where you can see all of the membranes really well. Again, on the inside of the heart is the endocardium. So this thin membrane that lines all the chambers on the inside is the endocardium. Then you have your thick layer of heart muscle, the myocardium. And then right on the outer surface of the heart, you have your epicardium. Okay, so right here, right on the surface, um, also known as your visceral pericardium. Remember when we look at these membranes that line our organs, we have the visceral layer right on top of the organ, and then that curves around to form the parietal layer. So this visceral pericardium, our epicardium, curves around and it forms another, my shadow right here is my light. Um, it forms another thin membrane right here and that's the parietal layer. So that's the parietal pericardium. Remember, there's a space between those two layers. That's the cavity that the heart has. That's the pericardial cavity, the space that's present between these two layers. On the very outside here, we have the fibrous pericardium or the pericardial sac. That's this thick, tough, strong layer right here that really forms that, um, like that wall and that cavity around the heart to protect it. All right, so let's go into detail with the valves. 